Hello and welcome. It's the Sunday just before Advent. It's the Feast of Christ the King. And the reading set for today is a very famous one that comes from Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. It's the famous sheep and the goats passage. And if you've been following the last few weeks, you'll have been aware that we're pursuing the theme of judgment. The church does this deliberately because we go through these cycles of relearning the great story of salvation. And in Advent, we get ready to prepare for the Messiah. John the Baptist said he, will, uh, he was to come to, to make known the salvation by the forgiveness of sins. And so in this period, as we come up to Advent, we're reminded of things that really matter, judgment, accountability, and of course, the coming of Christ to bear our sins if we want him to. The reading set begins at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and didn't take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly I tell you just as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's really quite hard to read these passages out in church and preach on them because there's something very threatening and very frightening about the prospect of hell and judgment. Uh, Jesus doesn't mince any words at all. Uh, he makes it very clear that there is a devil and his angels and from the foundation of the world, there was going to be a division, a division into heaven and hell. And human beings are stuck in the middle of this. Um, we either grow to become like the angels, only, only better because God has made it so, or we, or we decay and we become like the animals, uh, the worst animals. Um, and to some extent, it's our choice about whether or not we pursue the love of the good and the lovely, uh, or whether we turn our back and harden our hearts. This isn't just a matter of being weighed in the moral scales. It's very easy to take this passage and say, well, this is really just about being nice. And if you score, oh, I don't know, 51 on the nice scale, you go to heaven. And if you score 49 and, and, and 0.9 on the nice scale, well, then perhaps you go to hell. But of course, um, that would make a nonsense of everything we see in the New Testament. Uh, how people get judged is, of course, a mystery, and only God the Father knows, uh, and the Son to whom he deputes judgment. But it's more than just a scale of being nice. It's something that has to do with being aware 
of the struggle between good and evil and wherever we see the good embracing it. And we see the good most in Jesus. I flinch whenever I hear someone in the public space use the word of Jesus in name, when I hear them say Christ or, or Jesus or some combination of the other. I think you have no idea what you're doing, the damage you're doing to your soul, the, the amplification that you are giving to all evil which likes to laugh at Christ and reject him and scorn him. It's because there is some kind of inner spiritual struggle going on that lies behind the morality. And so if we judge people by, by their morality, we'll, we'll get it wrong. Um, but in this journey that human beings have, the figure of Christ is absolutely central. And where people recognise him and love him and submit to him and accept new birth at his hands, there is heaven. And where they find him threatening uh, or unappealing, uh, unnecessary, uh, there is the beginning of hell. The amazing thing is like the thief upon the cross at the very last minute, anyone can call out to Christ for mercy. And such is the love of God that he will give it. Jesus talks in this passage about the least of these my brethren and how we understand this passage revolves around that phrase. To tell you the truth, it's worried me for really quite a long time. But I think we have to say that the answer to it must lie in that great passage where we find it in, uh, in both in St Matthew and St Mark. Matthew twelve fifty, where Jesus is being called by people saying your, your immediate family is outside. They want to talk to you. Uh, and Jesus says, um, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, many people use this as a, a way of um, attempting to diminish uh, the Virgin Mary. But we'd see in scripture that uh, she, above all people, is committed to doing the will of the Father. So she remains his mother because, uh, both in, in, in biologically but also spiritually, because of her extraordinary obedience in the face of the great difficulty that the Incarnation was going to, to, to wreak in her life. But the same thing applies to us. Who are the brothers and sisters of Jesus? They are those who do the will of the Father. The, what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is to bring us to the Son, to introduce us to Jesus, uh, and to help us love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and of course, love our neighbour as ourselves, and then begin to exercise the great life of the Spirit in the Kingdom, to turn the other cheek, to forgive without limit, to trust and to love. Uh, this is what it is to be the brother of Jesus or the sister of Jesus. So Jesus says, when he says the least of these my brethren, he means people will be judged by the way in which they react to those who love him and associate with him. And essentially that means the church, not necessarily the visible church, um, but the spiritual church, people who are filled with the presence of Christ. One of the most striking things about us as our society at the moment is that whenever it comes to inviting people to be accountable for their moral choices in the name of God, whether it's over abortion or, or sexuality or, or selfishness or egocentricity or, or pride um, or, or war, uh, people react very strongly against those who carry Jesus to them. They react sometimes with a visceral hatred and it's very interesting in, in the whole argument that we're having now about, about gender and sexuality. The level of hatred that is directed towards Christians who speak out on behalf of God. This must have something to do with the spiritual struggle that's at stake when it comes to these issues. They're not just moral values. They're, they are part of a spiritual dynamic that lies 
at the heart of this struggle for the kingdom of heaven. I've always thought that my, my dear atheist friends um, distinguished themselves by their unwillingness to be accountable. So although they were very nice people, I liked them very much, I still like them. Uh, one of the reasons they rejected the idea of God was that there was a sense of inner pride and they refused to be accountable. They were prepared only to be accountable to their brains or to their wills or to their own judgment or their ego. They found it very difficult to allow for the very notion of a God because they knew the next step would be that they would be accountable to him. Indeed, Jesus says to us when he talks about our fears, um, be afraid of him who has the power to cast body and soul into hell. And that's probably one important angle to come at this passage with. We are afraid of many things. Uh, I know that I find, and I find a number of things difficult. Through my life I've been frightened of different things at different times. But Jesus says always, the thing to really be afraid of is, is the moment of judgment and God to whom we are accountable. The wonderful thing about being a Christian is that we get to cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then as we look into scripture, we see that Jesus who has gone to the cross precisely so that he can have mercy upon us, does and will have mercy. But our role is to remind people that they are accountable. We are God's voice. We are we are um, his people, his messengers, his presence in the world. And part of our job is to do it. Of course, there are different ways of doing it. We can, if we do it in a moralistic or judgmental or finger-wagging way, we're, we're just going to annoy people and get under their skin in a way that will make it hard for them to hear. But if we do it with humility and with love, there may be a chance that they will hear us. I once heard evangelism described in a very beautiful way as one beggar telling another beggar where they can both find some bread. And that's what we're here to do for our families, for our community, for our nation, and for our world. We're here to say there is a great moral struggle going on between good and evil. But God has made it possible to draw us onto the side of the angels. And he's done it by coming in Jesus. You really need to know Jesus. So when you speak his word in your mouth, you do it with love. And with gratitude, not with anger and with malice and with pride and with blasphemy. So may the church be faithful. May it look to do the will of God the Father. Every day, some of us many times a day, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be holy in my mouth and in my heart and in my eyes and on my lips and then we say straight away your kingdom come your will be done those who do the will of the father they are my brothers and the least of them the least important they are the ones whom i will use as a touchstone of judgment for the rest of society this means too for us that christ has never abandoned us he won't let us go. And as we struggle to do his will, day by day, week by week, and we fall flat on our faces, um, as, as like children learning to walk rather badly, we know he will never let us go because we are his brethren, his brothers and his sisters, his family, for we are struggling to do his will. It matters so much to him. So let us pray that he helps us keep faithful, be afraid of the right things, and invoke him in all we do. And give us ways of telling the people that we live amongst that their salvation, their eternal happiness, their very life itself, depends upon the recognition of the good as they come across it in Jesus and those who associate with him to do his will. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.